Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Behind the Shop, the epicenter of all things automotive. Today, we're not just going behind the shop, we're going behind the legend. Our guest is a titan in the world of classic cars, a man whose name echoes in the halls of automotive history, Wayne Carini, owner of F40 Motorsports and a mainstay on the Velocity Channel for over 15 years. Wayne has brought to light some of the rarest, most awe-inspiring vehicles this world has to offer through his show, Chasing Classic Cars. His passion isn't just a hobby, it's a legacy. From the sleek lines of a Ferrari to the classic charm of a Ford, Wayne has breathed life back into these machines, making the old new and the forgotten unforgettable. Today he's here with us, so strap in. Hold tight and prepare for the ride like no other. Welcome to this epic saga of Behind the Shop, starring Wayne Carini. Welcome, Wayne. We are thrilled to be sitting down with you. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and, and, and pretty much giving us the opportunity to sit with you. This has been 10 years in the making. I know we briefly mentioned to you about a decade ago, we signed up for a car show and we were very excited to sit next to you. And uh, unfortunately that didn't happen that day, but 10 years later we're sitting down with you and we finally get the opportunity to discuss a little bit about life, a little bit about shop. Um, you are an idol to us and it's it's truly a privilege to be here with you today. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't meet <laughs> 10 years ago, but uh, I'm a big believer in things are meant to be. So uh, it finally came true. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it's great sitting with you. Thanks. So thank you. So we just wanted to, talk, if you could just tell us a little bit of how you got started and from the beginning and to where you are today, if you could just give us a little background. I know we were just chatting a little bit how you went to school for arts or you majored in... Um, Art education. Art education. Yeah. And then if you could just kind of stem off of that, how you got into the Yeah, I mean, we could, we could spend hours doing this. But uh, uh, <laughs> basically, to uh, summarize everything, my, my father, um, when when I was growing up, he, he uh, ran a body shop. So he ran the body shop at Packard Motor Car Company in Hartford and uh, Monaco Ford in Glastonbury. And then he restored cars uh, in the family barn up, up on the family farm. He was the founder of the Model A Restorers Club of America in 1951. And then was, when I was uh, about eight years old, he put a piece of sandpaper in my hand and I just said, go like this, and I was hired. Um, my father went to every car show in, in New England as well as Hershey every year, and I, I started to do that with him and became very in tune with the automobile and uh, sort of had no choice. You know, when I go off the bicycle every day, I mean, the, the bus, I rode my bicycle to a shop, which was a, a mile away from the bus stop and worked with them every day, worked with them on weekends, all summer, and uh, never really had that childhood that I was really hoping for, you know, playing baseball and football and doing all those things. But yet it was a super education for me and something that when I went to high school and graduated high school, I said, I don't know if I want to do what my father does. He works two jobs. He works so hard, um, but, but he's a super talented person. I'd like to do something like that, but not have to work as hard as him. So I, I went to uh, college to be an architect uh, at the beginning, and then finally uh, graduated art education here in Connecticut. And couldn't find a job I'd liked, um, you know, teaching. So I went back to work for him for a summer until I could find the job that I was really looking for. And um, just so happens that we started fixing some Ferraris, of which I was passionate about since I was a child. Um, I got my first ride in a Ferrari at 10 years old, and, and that really... What kind set. of Ferrari? So it was a, a 1960 250 short wheelbase Ferrari. Um, we, we'd gone on vacation up in the Adirondacks, and there was a guy in a cabin next to us. He was a doctor from New York that had one and took me for a ride, and that was the Spark. Wow. So not only did you get to go in a cool car, but you had a good view too, right? <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you know, and that's what really intrigued me. And so next thing you know, that art job um, of being a teacher sort of took a back seat to my real passion, which was Ferraris and working on them. And, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that I was actually working on them and driving them. And people were talking to me about how to fix their cars. And it sort of took off. I mean, you know, and I never looked back. Um, it, it, 
the education that I got. But I believe that the education I got in art really helped me in the restoration aspect of restoring a car. The creative oh, eye. Creative eye. And I knew how to, uh, uh, had a great eye for color and still do, where I can make any color at all. I can match any color at all. So um, it certainly helped. That's for sure. And it, every part of your education, your whole life is, is, is a group of, of education. If you, if you do a simple thing, listen. My father told me once, he said, just shut up and listen. Yeah. And he <laughs> says, take it in. And, and you'll, you'll learn a lot from people if you just listen. Yeah. And right. we say it all the time about our, our guys at the shop. They're, they're artists yeah. because every, every job that comes in, it's amazing to it's see what the, it's a giant art project and to see how they kind of flip them and send them out the door. So when you have now bringing it to cars, it's truly a, you guys are artists making these beautiful pieces come back to life. Well, that's, that's the satisfaction of our business is that you start something that's very rough, sort of like being an artist. You start with a piece of clay. Next thing you know, you make a beautiful vase or you make a sculpture or whatever it is. And you do the same thing with cars. It comes in as a wreck or comes in as a, as a demolished or a dilapidated car to the restoration shop. And then you fix it and you restore it and you paint it and you upholster it and you stand back and you go, wow, I did that. You know, it's that satisfaction. And making people happy. And, and that's a big aspect of it, too, is make the customer happy. Yeah, yeah. That, that actually leads into the next question about now you, you took over your, you, your, your father's shop. You, you know, initially it wasn't the plan, but it ended up being your calling because it's kind of like similar to what happened to us. It wasn't really part of the plan, but when it's your calling, it just kind of pulls Falls you into in. your lap. Yeah. So we... Um, you know, have a similar, similar situation to you. But um, now that you, you stemmed into leading into the shop, now you have it going, what is the best, what is one of your favorite things about owning a collision restore, restoration shop or slash dealership? What is the, the highlight to you about all of this? Well, I, I think it's, you know, people say, what's your favorite car? And it's the next car. It's mm -hmm. that looking forward, never be satisfied with what you've got or what you've done. Mm -hmm always look for the next challenge. And I think that that's the, the biggest thing that really drives me every day. You know, I, I didn't want to work as much as my father. And I've actually worked harder probably than my father because, you know, <laughs> you, you just get into it. And if you enjoy what you're doing, it's not work. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, and going to car shows um, and, and being amongst friends, you know, it's, it's a whole group of people. And, and if, if you really get into that, um, for instance, we're, we're restoring a car for Pebble Beach this year. This will be my 39th straight year going to Pebble Beach. Wow. wow. It's just one of those things. It's a natural thing that you do every year. Mm -hmm. And you look forward to that moment, even though it's stressful as hell. Yeah. I mean, we're just about halfway done with the car. And we have six weeks left. We've been working on it for 18 months. Yeah, yeah. wow. But it's the last. We always work Diamonds best under Diamonds are created pressure. under pressure. That's yeah, right. I was just going to say that. the best. We always do our best work under pressure. Yep, and, yep. And it's so it's true. happening. And, and then you finally get there and you show the car. And it's that satisfaction that I, I made it. You know, And whether you win an award or not at Pebble Beach, if you've been invited to go to Pebble Beach, an honor. You've already made it. Yeah. Yeah. I've already won, you know, by driving that car onto the field, you know, and so everything else is like, you know, it's like cherry on, on the Sunday. The Sunday's great, but the cherry on top helps, but yet you've really made, uh, you know, an impression. Next yeah. goal is to go to Pebble Beach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, Someday. I started going there when I was, when I was very young with my dad and then I, I met my wife and I, and I, we dated for about five years before we got married and I didn't go to Pebble Beach at all. And then finally on our, it was just after we got married, she says, how come you haven't been going to Pebble Beach? I said, well, because you know, you and I were going out a lot. She goes, just go. Aww, and I know good. it's 39 years because we'll be married this year, 39 years. Wow. That's awesome. So yeah, Congrats, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's how I know every year. But and, and then you get really wrapped up in things. And next thing you know, this Pebble Beach becomes only one cog in the wheel. You know. So I guess that's um, leading up to our next question. A lot of shop owners have a lot of challenges. What would you say was the biggest challenge if it was either early on or recently that you can remember? Can you share a story, one of like your biggest, hardest moments or challenges? Well, I mean, um, 
Personally, my, our biggest challenge has been our, I have an autistic daughter, and, and that's been a challenge for life. But I wouldn't change it for the world. She's just the most fantastic girl in the world. So that's a, that's a huge challenge in my life. But um, I think one of the biggest things was is when I got out of the collision business. It was, it, so we were um, repairing cars in our collision shop and then restoring cars in, in a separate building. And I liked it. But yet, um, just it came the day when I, I, I like being in charge. I like being the person that makes the final call on things to make them right or wrong. And, and I just couldn't no longer work with insurance companies. I'm a perfectionist. And if it can't be perfect, I don't want to do it. And I just couldn't be that way anymore. And it was a big challenge that day that I made a decision to close the collision shop and to expand the restoration shop. It was a tough decision because you make so many friendships along the way with so many appraisers and so many people in the parts business and, and things like that. But then one day just to flip the switch and say, it's done. It was, it, I think personally, it was probably one of the most good, wonderful days of my yeah, life. It was a good decision. <laughs> yeah, was a good decision. But yet, we, you know, and it's a different aspect because we, we didn't shut the switch off and start a new one again. It, the restoration business was already rolling along. We had six employees doing restoration work. We had seven employees doing collision work. So it was it was one of those things that it was kind of easy to do, but yet it was it was a tough decision. Yeah, and it seems to be like a a more profitable market because I mean we deal with obviously the collision and it, it's very tough dealing yeah. with the insurance companies and. Several people have told us too. They're like, "Why don't you girls get into a full blown restoration?" And I'm like, "I don't it's know. It's just not our it's our thing, call. you know." Yeah, yeah, it's a tough call, especially if you don't have it established. We had the restoration business already established. Yeah. So you know, we had a great reputation. We had two years worth of backlog, and that's continued right till today. So it was easy for us, but still, it was it was a tough decision to make, and and. Uh, Although I don't regret Fridays um, because that's the day your stomach churns around mm -hmm. because Thursday night, Friday is the, how we're going to get all these cars done and out the door <laughs> and rental cars and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that th those are done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, we can yeah. relate. I can relate yeah, to that. I'm sure. <laughs> I, know, I know that feeling. So you took over, um, you, you turned your last name into one of the most iconic names in the world as far as classic cars. People know when they hear classic cars, they know your name. Looking back, what does that mean to you taking your, your last name and turning it into this huge name now? If your father could be here to see and tell you, what do you think he would, would say? Well, fortunately, he was around a little bit to see what all was going on. How this all started, it wasn't really my name. It was in the beginning when, when people are watching a TV show, sometimes they'll say, whenever I was walking around in airports, wherever, oh, aren't you that car guy? You know, and then all of a sudden, hey, Wayne. And after a year, it was, hey, Mr. Carini. And people got to know you, who you were. Um, it's amazing. They want to know what kind of sunglasses you have on, what kind of sneakers <laughs> you wear. It's crazy what happens. Um, so the story goes is that how I got into the TV aspect of the business was is that I um, I'm, I'm got the restoration shop. We have the sales business here at F40 Motorsports. And there was an article written about me in the New York Times uh, of a Hudson Italia that I bought right here in Portland on East Main Street. I chased that car from when I was 16 years old and tried to buy it. And I finally bought it when I was 51. Wow. And is it the one that has a big like point? Well, it's sort of rounded. It's very strange. It made, made 25 examples. And a gentleman on East Main Street, Ray Robinson, had that. My father and he worked together at Pratt & Whitney. My father worked second shift Pratt & Whitney and had the restoration shop. And he, he drove it to the shop one day um, to have a little scratch fixed in it. And I sort of fell in love with it. This is when most people had Camaros and Mustangs. And here I love this 53 Hudson Italia, which is a weird looking car. So I knew. So something. you like things that are unique. I like them um, unusual and unique. Yeah, it like, stands out from I the like crowd. I like stuff that nobody else has got. Yeah. I finally bought the car and I kept after it. I finally bought it when I was 51, 52, I think it was. So what was that moment like? Oh, that was that was like um, hitting the lottery that yeah. day. It really was. I had maintained the car for the lady, uh, Hazel Robinson, who was given it to, to her by her brother. And... She wanted to change the tires on it. And it's a totally original car with the original tires still on it. And I said, Hazel, I would not do that if I were you, but I'll do whatever you want. 
and so she called me and she said, I want to talk to you. And I walked into the house one day and she was had big alligator tears coming down. I said, what's wrong? She goes, I would have ruined the car by changing the tires. I think that my days are done with the car. You should own it. And, wow. and I, she said, well, how much will you offer me for it? I told her amount. She agreed. I ran to the bank as fast as I could, got her a certified check. And uh, I took the car that day. And it was like the one of the biggest moments of my life. That's so you know, exciting. Getting so cool. I mean, a car that I've been after all that time. A friend of mine, Donald Osborne, uh, wrote an article about that experience. And it w- appeared in the New York Times. It was a full page Sunday in the automobile section when automobile section was still part of the New York Times. Now, do you still have that car? I still do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the head of my production company, Jim Ostrowski, read that article and on Sunday and called me on Monday morning and said, I'd like to do a TV show about you. I read this article about you yesterday and you seem like a cool car guy. And I'm looking for somebody to do a, a TV show with about automobiles for Discovery Channel. So he came up with the camera um, about 45 minutes after we got off the phone. Wow. And we sat in my office for a half an hour and talked. And he said, I said, if you don't get in my way, I'm running a business here. Um, I said, I'm taking 10 cars to Pebble Beach this year. And he about fell off his chair. We had cars going to auction and shows. And um, he got the camera out of the car and we started filming. Amazing. Wow. And that was uh, almost 19 years ago. Well, congratulations. Yeah. That is. And so what it did is, is that we did two one-hour specials. The network really loved it. Um, we were at Pebble Beach filming again without a contract. And Shauna, the head of uh, production or head of uh, programming for Discovery, uh, spent two days with us. And she said, you know, you guys really know what you're doing. We'd like to offer you a TV show. You can name it anything you want. We'll give you 12 episodes a year. And so we came up with the, the name Chasing Classic Cars. And, and after the second year, it became so big that it was crazy. So after the second year, they offered me a four-year contract. And I continued with four-year contracts uh, from then on uh, up until just uh, recently, which uh, we've uh, finally ended the program and I've started a new project. So, yeah, so... It, we became the most popular automotive television show in the world, the longest running, continuously running automotive television show in the world. And we are now shown in 100 countries and my voice is dubbed in 38 languages. Wow, that's extremely Yeah, I mean, who would ever know? I would never know. And, and I didn't try to be on TV, but... You're a huge celebrity. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, what is crazy. that like? What does that feel it, like? Yeah. It's a little crazy when people recognize you and they scream out your name, you know, and everywhere you go and, and want your picture taken with you. So, does it feel surreal or... It, I, I, I'm really honored. Um, I'm really honored. I, I believe my fans are, you know, without them, I would have nothing as far as, you know, notoriety and, and the fame I've, I've created or I've gotten. So, you know, I make sure that I spend time with them. I listen to them. I shake their hands. I take pictures. I do all these things, sign autographs, whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And that's brought me a lot of notoriety in itself that, you know, I'm I'm so good to my fans. Mm -hmm. A lot of people aren't. I've I've been with other people and they just brush them off and and don't pay attention. I think you truly are very good to your fans. Well, and and, and that that comes with with your upbringing. You know, I, I, I was brought up in a big Italian family and there was nine brothers and sisters in my grandfather's family. And we got to know each other and talk to each other. And, you know, and, and I think that that was it. It was the upbringing uh, in my family. I guess to take a little ride in the past, what is your favorite memory from your upbringing? That you, is there like anything that sticks out to you that you remember that was like car related or not? Being with my, being with my father, but I, probably the best memories were uh, being with my uncle Al, okay, he was just such a peach of a guy, and I mowed his lawn every Saturday morning, and we would go in and have uh, open face um, uh, tomato and cheese sandwiches. I still can taste them, you know, yeah. and and just he was the most wonderful guy in the world. So, so you looked did, up I, to him. Yeah, I did. I mean, you know, and I I would do anything for him. So I think that you know, and and all of his all of his brothers and his sisters, they were all great, great people. Very nice. Yeah. That's similar to us where our grandfather was our our role model in our lives. So continuing his legacy is one of our dreams. So And I had a great grandfather too, you know, and he taught me a lot of things. You know, one of the things he taught me was keep moving. It's hard to hit a moving target. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. 
And our grand, oh, well, before we got into this business, he's like, this is a tough business, girls. You got to have an iron gut. Yeah, so true. we definitely learned. That's true. Learned that along. But I like that. It's hard to hit a moving target. Yeah. That's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Stick just with just keep moving. Yeah. That's all. Never sit down. That's why I do 15 to 18,000 steps a day. Just keep moving. Oh, wow. Hey, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did you go to the next one? Um, oh. Well, actually, I'll lead up into this question because this is good. Um, you've done so many projects throughout the years and on your show. Is there a particular one that stands out that was your favorite? Probably. I've got a couple of favorites. Um, we did a 250 shore wheelbase Ferrari that had been rolled over and it was a disaster. And we had to sort of make the whole car again. We did a 275 Ferrari like that. So it was, it was very satisfying. Um, but probably the one car that did it for me was the 365P Ferrari, which has a center steering. So two seats on either side. You sit in the middle of the car with a steering wheel in the min middle. They made two of those. And when I was a kid, I'd look through the window of Kennedy Motors down in Greenwich, and I'd see that car, and I would just go, oh, my God, that's the coolest thing in the world. It's got a center steering wheel in it. And one day, Mr. Kennedy called me and, and asked me to restore the car for him. And I restored it, and I drove it on the lawn at Pebble Beach. And that was probably one of the highlights of my career was was doing that. You know, my wife on one side, my best buddy on the other side, and me driving the car on the lawn. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, was, uh, we got to try to truly find a picture of that. Oh, yeah, it's easy. I'll send, I'll send you. Okay, that would be a cool one to put into that. And, you know, having my father be able to see. Unfortunately, my dad, um, my mom... Um, she had a stroke and, and she really couldn't understand um, too much of what my TV career was about. And she started the TV career in the family. She uh, chosen to be on The Price is Right in 1961. Oh, how cool. And she was on The Price is Right and then became the champion, came back again. So she was on TV first, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, she never got to see my success. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm sorry. I'm but sure my dad she's did, watching. So that was good. And my dad was on quite a few of the shows. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they're both watching from up above oh, and sure. they're so sure. proud of you and they're your, you know, your guardian angels. Yeah. And I guess that's a little bit of, um, do you believe in manifestation? Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of the things well, that you, you know, I believe in things are meant to be. And, and every time I get a car, you know, recently I, I tried to buy a hot rod, uh, here in Connecticut at, at Carter Hill. I went there and I saw this hot rod and it was so beautiful, 36 Ford coupe. And I went over and tried to buy it. And the guy said, well, give me, give me an hour and let me think about it and come back to me. I went back to him in an hour. He says, I'm sorry, I just sold it 10 minutes ago. You got me thinking about it. And some guy came along. I told him the price and he bought it. Come to find out, I know the guy that, he bought, that bought it. Okay. And I said, if you ever want to sell it, well, he called me two years later and I finally got the car. So okay. things are meant to be. Sometimes They're you have to be perfect patient. Perfect timing. Yeah. You have to yes. be patient. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so with all these supercars, hypercars, and electric cars, what do you think the future is going to be for classic cars? Well, I think classic cars will, will be around um, now. Sedans and, and coupes and hardtops and things like that of the 20s may go away because uh, those were, became very popular in the 50s and the 60s because your uncle had one or your father had one and you wanted one because of that. Well, that doesn't happen today. You know, there's, there's very few and far between uh, kids are saying, I'm looking for a 25 Buick. It just doesn't happen. So a lot of the cars will go away. Um, but I believe special cars will, will always be here to stay. They're pieces of art. Yeah. You know, they're sculptures and and uh, they have a great following and great investments. I mean, Duesenberg's, you know, when a Duesenberg sold for a million dollars, people said, oh, my God, that's like that's craziness. Well, they're five and six million dollars today. So great investments, you know, and, and there are like saying, well, um, they're not making any more Van Goghs. Well, that doesn't mean that Van Goghs are, are worthless. They're worth more than ever because yeah. they're very few. Mm -hmm. So um, and I and I think the electric cars have a place in society. I'm not truly sold on them being the, the one mode of transportation in your family. We're we're people, a country of freedom. And we want to know that we could get in a car today and drive to Florida. If I wanted to get in right this minute and say, I'm going to Florida, I'm going to drive there tonight. I'll be there tomorrow. Well, you can't do that very easily with an yeah. electric car. You have to plan your trip. Yeah. It's going to take almost twice <laughs> you, as long. You tried doing that, right? 
planning a trip with an electric car. And- yeah, my my boyfriend actually got an electric car, and it's like always. We were always driving my car. <laughs> it's when, a debacle. When a car, when an electric car has a range of five to eight hundred miles, mm-hmm. then it's it's feasible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, where you can go and pull into a hotel and plug it in for the night, and then finish your trip the next day. Mm-hmm. But um, when that doesn't happen, it's just they're good for local transportation. I, I had a Tesla, and I had battery anxiety. So I bought a Tesla when they first came out. It was the car that my wife and I went to dinner on Friday or Saturday nights in. We would pick restaurants close by because we said, are we going to have enough battery to get home? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, and I, and I get to test drive different electric cars uh, quite often. I love them. Uh, their speed, the quietness and all that stuff. But I'm still a V8. Me or too. 12. I, I like the smell yeah. of gas and <laughs> like that sound bit. that yeah, you get. Sound. So sure. it just it gives you and it just makes you happy. Otherwise, yeah. you turn the electric car and it's like, yeah. you don't even hear it. You're like, is it on? I don't know. <laughs> so it's fun. There's something fun about these cars that are just give you life yeah. again. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, am I next? So we're just going to rattle off some quick questions and if you could just shoot off the first answer that comes to the top of your mind and, and if you could do it in one word. Okay. So what's your favorite car brand? Uh, Ford. Okay. What's the most underrated classic car in your opinion? Um, oh, wow. Um, Ford GT350. Okay. What's the most overrated classic car in your opinion? Um, Porsches. <laughs> I can agree with that. Yeah. Um, what's your dream car? 250 short wheelbase Ferrari, 1960. Yeah. I've restored eight of them, and uh, they're over $10 million, and so I'll never own one for myself, but that's okay. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, it's like, exciting that you probably put your heart and soul into these passion projects. And get to you help. never know, though. I yeah, feel yeah, like yeah. You, you, may come, you make things I'd happen. I have to yeah. sell so. everything in my life, and I might be able to do it. <laughs> okay. What's the fastest speed you've ever driven? 178. Wow. You're like a, a moving bullet. <laughs> right? I have a Bonneville car, and my goal is to do 200 miles an hour. Um, we took it to Bonneville a couple of years ago, blew the transmission the first run, and that was it. So, But it could be a sign from God, you know? <laughs> Maybe you can <laughs> That's okay. take those no, well, signs. My, of... <laughs> my new goal is I have that car. It's a 32 Ford. It's a very famous car, the Jimmy Shine Tony Thacker 32 it's done 248 before, so I want to do 2 to 210 in that car out of Bonneville, so we'll see what happens. Oh, that's, that is <laughs> that's a fast. goal. <laughs> yeah. What's a car you regret selling? Um, uh, the Stutz Bearcat I had, 1921 Stutz Bearcat. These are also interesting because a lot of these, I'm going to have to like go look them up because <laughs> yeah. some of these I don't even know what they look like, but... I remember I'm when we excited. Came last yeah, when we year came and you showed us all these you. really cool cars, and you did the the ugliest cars. Oh, I did my spawn. The, the spawn was here. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's at the uh, AACA museum right now. That was that was a cool. That episode. was cool because we learned a lot about all the misfit vehicles that you guys were bringing up, and we we're like searching them as you guys were talking. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, the, sh- the Mustang. I, it was a Mustang Shelby GT350. I said Ford, but but uh, that's a very underrated car, but not anymore. It's starting to climb in value. There are three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars now but i can't understand i mean i like porsches but yet if you could buy a gt350 mustang compared to a porsche hands down Mm -hmm. we're mustang babies our first car was a mustang i love love that car um what's a car you regret not buying when you had the chance um four gt when they when they came out with the new models i had the opportunity to buy one i was on the list and we were just building our new house and um, I couldn't tell my wife she couldn't have the kitchen of her dreams because I was buying a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar car. So, yeah, so, I, so I gave it up. I gave it up, uh, and, and the gentleman that got me the car through his dealership, uh, I said, "Listen, just sell it. Sell it to one of your customers. I appreciate you getting it for me, but I just can't." And it was a stupid move because I I could have bought it and sold it. And you know, made five or six hundred thousand dollars. Wow! At the, at the time, it was there was too many things going on in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I bet she loves her kitchen, though. She probably she makes great kitchen. meals. Yeah. I, love <laughs> I love the kitchen. In the long run, it was probably yeah. worth it. <laughs> and she's Italian as well. No. Oh, okay. No, she's Irish. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're fully Italian. Irish and Italian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, very cool. She's full Irish. Yeah. 
What's your favorite car movie or TV show apart from your own? Um, movie, um, Bullet or Lama, one or the other. Um, and TV show, um, I don't know. That's a good one. Choosing classic cars. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, I don't, I don't really watch them. You know, I've already. You're done so it. busy. Who has? I know. Well, I mean, this I've, done, you have, I've like, already been there and done that. And my grandson gets the biggest kick out of it now. He, he says, "You're on TV again, Pop Pop. I don't, I don't get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting here, but you're up there too. Oh, that's a, yeah. That's so, so cute. Um, you know, I, I, I like some car shows. Uh, I, I really liked. Um, I'm not quite sure. That's that's a good. Good question. Nobody's asked me that before. <laughs> but yes, we got one. Yeah. Here. <laughs> I could think of a hundred of them. So I don't <laughs> want to PO any of my friends that were on them. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. Because you know a lot of people in the biz. Um, automatic or manual transmission? Oh, manual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> road trip or racetrack? Oh, uh, God. Um, I like racetrack. Uh, I like road trips, too. Um, the, the best road trips I've taken lately is so during COVID, I bought a brand new Corvette C8, and we got it. Um, the week that COVID started. And um, every Saturday, I take my autistic daughter, Kimberly, and we go for three hour rides mm-hmm. to nowhere. Yeah. I got to meet, know everything about Connecticut, uh, wow. Massachusetts, and Rhode Island because we would just go with no place to go. Mm-hmm. You know, we're a society where we got to get from point A to point B and get there as quick as you possibly mm-hmm. can. Mm-hmm. Nothing like just going out and turning. Right and say, I wonder where this goes. Those yeah. are the best days. Having yeah. no destination no and destination. just seeing where and the car stop. takes you. You couldn't stop. There was no restaurants open. There was nothing. You know, there was Dunkin' Donuts, maybe. That was about it. And that was probably the best. Those memories, those moments. Yeah. It was really good. makes you appreciate those moments, too, yeah. especially the time that we were going through. Yeah. You know? but, um, what was the weirdest thing you've ever found in a car you were restoring? Um, well, let's see. I've found handguns. Um, I've, uh, let's see, possum, a petrified possum in the, in the headliner. Oh, he was still alive. No, no. Petrified. It was dead a long time. Oh, oh petr- I thought it was like, ah! <laughs> it's petrified. Yeah. Okay. That was on one of our shows. Okay. Uh, that was on one of our shows. Oh, yeah. that's it was, it was just that we drive in it and the headliner fell down and the possum Ooh. fell out of it. Oof. You, know, you never know. Yeah. We actually, um, I mean, we were repairing a, a vehicle and there was bullets all around it so it was like shot at we restored we restored a ferrari that uh, belongs to miles davis miles davis the the jazz guy and um there was a story out how he'd gotten shot at in the car and we stripped the paint off and there was there was the bullet holes wow yeah here it is full of bondo (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Same. We saw some stuff that was trying to be covered up and we're like, yeah. we let the owner They said know. it was like, Miles Davis's car and that's how we proved it. Yeah. It really was his car. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. <laughs> if you could go on a road trip with any person alive or dead, who would it be? Uh, my daughter, Kimberly, and my grandson, Connor. Two of them. Okay. Yeah. That's very just, nice. Just do a hot rod tour or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Family. That's mm-hmm. all. But, you Most know, important uh, thing. You, you, you get to know all these people. I'd, I'd love to do it. Unfortunately, I'm so busy. But the, the best, probably the best road trip next to my daughter was is that I used to go on and still looking forward to it next year is the Colorado Grand, where we do a thousand miles in cars. And um, every place in Colorado that it says 65 miles an hour, you can go as fast as, as you want. Oh, that would be a dream. And we have a police <laughs> escort. That is so cool. That's oh, really cool. That's, that's, <laughs> that's beyond amazing. cool. Yeah. You do that once a year? Yeah, it's in September. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it, start, it starts, uh, in, you know, it's right in Colorado. We go to all the different ski resorts. This is another bucket list item that yeah. we're going to have to add. Oh, it's you. fabulous. It's, it's really fabulous. <laughs> that sounds awesome. It's so much fun. So now everybody can just go, go as fast as they can and, like, does it turn into competition or <laughs> well, you try like, not to make a competition usually you, you, you travel the first day you get to know each other a little bit and you see who's going fast so you go in maybe three or four cars together um and you and you take one of the motors so motorcycle policemen with you so they can watch over you and um, the best part of that is the elevations in colorado so you get a group like us we're doing 120 130 miles an hour and the other guys are doing 75 and 80 and you look like two miles down, you know, you're up on a plateau and you can see these guys in front of you. And it's just like fishing and reeling them in, oh, wow. you know, faster. And you, you're <laughs> pulling them in and finally you go past them, you know, 
over 100 miles an hour. They're doing 70, and they, you know, almost like Butch Cassidy and Sundance could. Who are those guys? Oh, you know, that's so awesome. it's a lot of fun. So you're an adrenaline junkie. I am. Well, I'm <laughs> from so, that. Go karting with my grandson. He's not trying to, I mean, you know, stay slow at all. He wants to go faster and faster. Fast. Oh, so cool. We got go karts. My grandson and I just have so much fun on go karts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. We grew up with go karts, and yeah. I think that's a little bit Me why. Too. That was our, gra- yeah. our, our uh, great memory with our grandfather. Yeah. He, yeah. Got, us our he got us our first All right. We went around the shop corner with his hat backwards, and he's like, come on, girls. And we jumped in, and that's kind of how it started for us, too. That's great. And we figured out very early on how to um, do the governor so we can make it go faster. faster. And we were like five or six. And we'd be ripping it around. They're like, how's it going so fast? <laughs> you know. And then if we would hit, it, uh, hit our tire and it would go flat, we'd just pull it into the shop. Joe, fix our go kart. <laughs> so, at a very early age, we were uh, a lot of fun. having it fixed up. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you taking time, sitting down, and talking to us. Um, we just wanted to know do you have any future plans? And obviously, showbiz, you were telling us a little bit about the other shows yeah. you've got going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, Bob Scanlon was the president of Velocity Channel when Motor Trend bought. Uh, velocity from discovery bob left and i knew bob was not retiring so i said when you find out your next adventure please let me know he called me about two years ago and said speed vision the name speed vision which was the first automotive program um, that was uh, developed um, out of some guys in espn roger warner and bob scanlon and so um, the name was out there and the copyright was not uh, renewed so we got the name Speed Vision, and we're creating our own network now. We're on Roku and FUBU. We're on Amazon Prime. Um, So, And then we're we're looking for linear distribution right now, and we're streaming on those. Uh, We have 700 hours of library of different shows that we're showing on there right now. Amazing. Personally, I'm doing a new show called On the Road with Wayne Carini, doing another show about auctions. It's called The Classic Hammer. And then I'm doing a podcast, uh, which is called Car Talk with Jay Ward of Pixar Studios. And Jay and I just talk about classic cars and what's going on in the world of cars. So it's keeping me busy. Three new shows. You are a very busy man. And like, do you, ha- do you have any plans of ever slowing down? No or? plans of slowing down. Yeah. I mean, retirement's you know, not in my vocabulary. Yeah, I'm, I love it. I enjoy playing golf maybe once a year, and that's about it. So I'm not a golfer. I enjoy you know, being with my family, uh, being with my employees, restoring cars, having great customers, and uh, going to car events all over the world. So it's a pretty pretty cool gig I've got. Yeah, and yeah. I, I don't look forward to, I mean, that's what people retire to do, mm-hmm. you know, so I've already you doing have the dream, it. Yeah, you have the, the dream, dream life. Yeah. yeah. It is pretty, pretty, uh, you know, it's it, everything's got its pitfalls, but yet. Uh, if, you if, do what you love, you don't work a day. Yeah. I guess that's what they say. <laughs> I <laughs> but, tell myself that at four o'clock in the morning when I get up and I got to go again, you know? Yeah. But it's fun. What are, what are now to leave off our viewers with, what are three tips that you would give them as if they want to get into the business or anything, if they're looking to get into owning a classic car, what are three things you can share with them? Well, uh, people always ask me, what should I buy to start with? You mm-hmm. know, young people, especially, because that's the people we really need to get into our industry is young people like you that are enthusiastic, that want to go out and, and share their cars and enjoy them. And I always tell people, buy something that's different. Buy something that's a little unusual. Mm-hmm. So if you go to a show and there's 100 Mustangs lined up or 200 Camaros, and then you show up with a Pinto station wagon mm-hmm. or a Gremlin, or something like that that's very unusual, a station wagon. Station wagons, everybody loves a station wagon because you can think of your youth, you know, when you're in a station wagon. Yeah. So I always give that advice, you know, buy something that's unusual and people will talk to you. You won't have to go out and seek them. They will come to you mm-hmm. and you'll be known for your car. It's a good conversation. Piece. It is. Yeah. It is. And it's, it's, it's a good way of getting started, you know. And then, of course, I always say to buy the best you can. So don't, don't go in cheap. You know, so if you got a, let's say that you got a $10,000 budget and you, but you could afford a $12,000 car, go for that $12,000 car. Buy the best example you possibly can buy because you'll never regret it. You know, like buy you low there. production, you know, cars that they made very few of, color combinations that they made very few of, because those are going to be the cars in demand 
yeah. down the road. You know? The art statement pieces yeah. will be valued. And as far as getting in the business, I mean, people always want to get in the business. And, and I always say it's very hard. You know, it's a lot of work, and, and, but it's very satisfying too. So I encourage people to please do that. We need as many craftsmen in this business. I'm on the board uh, out at McPherson College in Kansas where we have a four-year automotive restoration program. And uh, so I, we really appreciate all the young people that go to that. Um, we have an uh, intern just uh, that started last year, Mason Ball. Mason just got married two weeks ago, and he's coming here this weekend, and he's going to work here. He and his wife uh, are moving from Texas to Connecticut, and so yeah. we, we welcome him and welcome uh, uh, guys from Vinyl Tech. We have a few Vinyl Tech employees. So, uh, you know, we, we encourage people to get in the business, that's for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. We are so honored to be here and it's a pleasure sitting and talking to you. You have an awesome story. And for any of our viewers, if you, uh, if they want to follow you, how can they get in touch with you? Can you tell them your platforms that they can find you on? Sure. Yeah. So you can go to waynecarini.tv. Um, that's, that's really the platform where you get to see most of the stuff. Our merchandise is on there. And then um, Facebook, Wayne Carini Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, and and uh, and then F40 Motorsports, you know, F40.com, where you can see all of our cars we have for sale. And then we follow some of the restorations on our Facebook and Instagram sites. So uh, it, you can watch what we're doing. Thank Very cool. So well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time today and sitting down with us. And we hope that we can, you know, Come we'll and stop stuff by together. and yeah, do stuff in the future. Yeah. But Absolutely. Don't Thank forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel to stay tuned with future videos. Bye. This is our back showroom. We've got another showroom up on top with about 65 cars in it. So okay. how often are you like flipping cars? I hope a lot. Are, are they rotate <laughs> you rotating them out like Yeah, I mean I we love just sold that. the Jag the other day. This that's going tomorrow. This is this is going on Friday. This Porsche. Oh wow! I the truck the other day. That's, that's probably next week. Okay. So you sell them on your website. People go there, and that's right. how they find them. And we add okay. advertising Hemmings and mm. you know, some of the other sites. But, uh, and we're just try starting to try bring a trailer. Um, mm. We've got a Dino Ferrari going on there in a couple of weeks. So right now, what's one of your favorite? vehicles that's in well there. i mean i've got uh, a couple of my own cars so that's a cadillac ctsv wagon um that car is pretty spectacular i love that car i love station wagons um that's got uh, 585 horsepower six-speed transmission you do about 170 miles an hour that station wagon wow but this this is probably my favorite car in here so this is this car was in the movie Fast and Furious uh, 7 and 8. Oh, wow. So Vin Diesel sat in the car, and they filmed with them. This exact car, this car Vin yeah. Diesel was in? Yep. Ah. What? That's, That's amazing. This was, uh, this was built for George Poteet from Rad Rods by Troy, built this car. Um, I had no idea. I went to his place in Mississippi to buy two cars, and I ended up with five cars that day, and this was one of them. This um, is, I, and I like the interior, how like yeah, this, simple it is. So this, this car has won about every award in the country. This won the SEMA award, won the Good Guys Street Car of the Year award. It's won all the different awards all over the country. I love it. Um, it was built by Troy for George uh, Poteet. George is the fastest piston driven man in the world at Bonneville. He does 487 miles an hour in a piston driven car. Wow. Which wow. most guys are like, jet cars that go that fast, not George. And so uh, this car was built for him. He wanted a NASCAR for the street. He wanted it out of a Ford Talladega. So that's what they started with. Um, it has a uh, it's a Boss 429 engine in it um, with um, 785 horsepower. Um, it's, it's a pretty spectacular car. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. This is oh, honestly right. one of the coolest cars I think I've ever seen. Yeah, this is this is a work of art. Yeah. That it is. Really is. Just like the whole color scheme and... Yeah, the wheels, the way it sits, everything about it. Mm hmm So now, is this for sale? Obviously, it's for well, sale. Well, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those cars that... It's hard to let go. It, it, it came out of the barn about three weeks ago to go to a car show, and I said, let's not put it back in the barn. Let's see. 
I've got four guys who really want it. So yeah. when I'm ready. did you guys do anything to it? No, just maintain it. That, <laughs> that's it. It was uh, it's a car that was totally done and well driven. They've driven it across the country three times. The different oh, wow. tours. Wow. So it, was, it, was like, it looks brand new. Yeah, it's it's, it's a pretty spectacular car. Wow. It sounds it. I mean, it's, yeah, say it's, it's, it's sounds very loud. And I like this. This is so cool. Yeah. I don't yeah, think no, I've ever seen anything like that. It was, this car is totally custom built. So uh, the only original part of the car is the roof panel itself. Right here. That's it. The rest of it widened, stretched, shortened, mm -hmm. a little bit of everything. We're going to have to watch that, that episode. Um, that seven, seven and eight. eight. I've seen it. it. It's been a little bit. So you can see, you can see it in the trunk. That, Fuel cell, I mean, again, another work of art. Oh, wow. Yes. That is okay. cool. That is so cool. Yeah, it's a pretty cool car. And the dash, just don't. Yeah, this went to the Greenwich Concourse. So I was the Grand Marshal there this year, and I showed uh, 13 of my cars. I want to put some things in the And this one, I think, got the most attention out of all the cars as well. Very nice. And we've got the showcase, which the company I represent, that's the showcase. I mean, we've got in there, this is J10. This is a Ford GT a Le Mans race car. And uh, it's sitting in there, and it'll, it's totally rust, uh, I mean, uh, dust free. These are so good in a garage because uh, there's there's nothing can happen to it. So no rodents are going to get in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no moisture because there's a fan blowing air. So if you feel, come on over here and you can feel the, that's mm -hmm. the amount of air blown over the car at, mm -hmm. at all times. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's strong. You're a part sponsor with them? Yeah, no, I'm a representative Part of representative of the company. Yeah. for the um, car capsule. Car capsule, yep, showcase. Um, so you can I'm a, a partner in, in McKee's 37 Wax Company down in, in um, Stewart, Florida, where we have make our own waxes and polishes and stuff. Oh, wow. Hmm. So, Pretty cool. Amazing. For Craftsman Tools, Brand Ambassador for Haggerty Insurance. <laughs> You're involved in it all. Yeah. I try to be. Try to. What else we got? Any other cool uh, stories? We got, this is my Ford GT350R, so that's... Uh, Got this one here. That's got five miles on it. Wow! And it sits up there, for five miles. How do you decide like what car you want to drive? Like, are you like, oh, I'm going to get ice cream. I'll take a. Well, it's like the other day I, <laughs> I was going to Hot Rod Show and I said I haven't driven the Chevy truck since last year. Okay, mm -hmm. what the Chevy truck? Yeah, you have a, a certain kind for every event, you know. And so and and I never get my own cars fixed. So we started painting my Ferrari there. About a year and a half ago, and there it sits. Isn't it funny how that goes? Like it's like, you, yeah, hat, hats on the back burner. Oh, yeah. So you never have, time. Never have yeah. time. I hope to finish it this year. So I've got about 10 of those projects. Sounds really great. Yeah, that's really cool. Testarossa. I love it. This is so cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy we showed this because this is like, I remember we came here <laughs> for the uh, Christmas. Yeah, well, Christmas. I mean, it's, it's just. This is one part of the business. Yeah. This is where the collision shop used to be. Yeah. Yeah, and the paint shop's behind that wall. Okay. The collision shop was here, and so we transformed it into the back showroom. Yeah. It needed more and more room all the time. Yeah. Yes, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. Never. I like this one. This is yeah, cool. Yeah, it's a nice Jag. Let's go into Colorado. Oh, yeah. that one's sold? Yep. Does Just this, I know some of the Jags, you know how that used to like lift up when you turn it on? Does this do that? Oh, no, that's a different. The oh. bonnet lifts up that way. So we've got one that just came in for restoration there. That'll, that'll go in restoration probably. That's one of my favorite colors. Yep, opalescent blue. Mm -hmm. This one, um, that's a very early one, the green one. So they call this an outside latch welded louver, which is the most... I really saw it after XC. So when they were first building them, they made a flat floor instead of a step down floor. Then they had these louvers and they, they built these bonnets solid without these louvers in it. And they found that the car was overheating. Mm -hmm. So they just got some pin snips out and they cut 
put a hole here and there. And they said, now test it. Well, all of a sudden, the car's now overheating. Mm -hmm. So they had to fill the holes in. They had all these bonnets made, so they just cut the holes and they welded the loop. Mm -hmm. And then they put the latches on the outside to hold the bonnet down. Mm -hmm. So the first 200 cars had that. Oh, and every, awesome. all the other cars were made with it. was already stamped in the bonnet. Now, how do you say this? The name of this car? Jaguar. Jaguar? Okay. Because some people Jaguar. say Jaguar. Yeah, I'm not a Jaguar. <laughs> yeah. Jaguar. I always say Jaguar, and I'm like, have I been I saying it wrong Porsche my whole Jaguar. life? Porsche. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> it's yeah. Porsche, whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a wrap for today's exciting interview with the man, the myth, the legend, the respectable car enthusiast himself, Wayne Carini. It was an absolute honor to sit down and talk shop with you. We are forever grateful and thank you so much for showing us your amazing showcase of cars. It was so cool to just talk with you. For everyone that liked this interview, please comment, share, like, and don't forget to subscribe and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye.